Your friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Every once in a while, although not so much lately, I used to get a letter from either a book club or a record club. And they wanted us to join, of course, and purchase their products. Well, the carrot that these companies used to dangle before their new subscribers was to offer up a whole bunch of free CDs or books or things like that. Usually it was about 10 of them. Now, of course, there's a catch to that. You have to agree to buy a certain number of additional items at the club price over the next year, usually. In short, they wanted a commitment from you for the free stuff. They wanted you to buy their products. Now, in all fairness, some of these clubs were a pretty good deal, okay? But others turn out to be quite expensive because the club price ends up being higher than what you could purchase it in a store. So, what do you do with that? Well, there was one particular offer I gotta tell you about. It's the one that I considered was the best deal going at the time and I really haven't heard anything better yet. This is how that worked. You were to pay the paltry sum of just one dollar and you'd get a CD that was just full of Mozart pieces. Great stuff. But here's what made that offer really attractive. You weren't required to buy anything else ever. The club was easy to join. No commitment required. Now sometimes I wonder if we don't think that's the way it is or at least ought to be with the church and this thing we call discipleship. We often view the church as a club that we are Get joining in order to get some kind of consideration, some kind of satisfaction for ourselves. Getting something out of it rather than putting something into it. And when it comes to discipleship, well, we tend to think of that as an option, not a requirement. In other words, the Church of Christ has this very attractive look to it, at least as long as there's no commitment required on our part. But in today's Gospel from Luke, Jesus tells us that things are not that way. They are drastically different. If we're going to follow him, and that's the meaning of discipleship, following the master, if we're going to follow him, there is an extremely high price to be paid. A commitment is required. And Jesus cautions us that before we set out to follow him, we had better count the cost and make sure that we're willing to pay it before we get started. So, here's what we're going to do today. We are going to look at the high cost of discipleship. And we're going to do this using, well, three coins as a visual aid here, okay? Sort of reminds me of that old song, Three Coins in a Fountain. Remember how that went? Three coins in a fountain, each one seeking happiness, Thrown by three hopeful lovers, which one will the fountain bless? Only instead of a fountain today, we're going to use our baptismal font. That's close. That's what we might call our fountain of life. And as we count each of the three costs that Jesus mentions today, we're going to put a coin in that baptismal font. Kind of as an offering, if you will. In other words, it's going to be a sign of our trust that by doing so, we will be blessed. Okay, so, the first price, what is that? Well, unfortunately, Jesus says, it's the family. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Well, here we go again. Jesus making these wild statements that just don't seem to square in the face of reality. But that's what he says. And he's serious. But we modern Christians aren't the first ones to struggle with this kind of a demand. When Jesus first spoke these words, he was talking to huge multitudes of people. People that were following him around. They'd heard about him heard his, about his teachings, heard about the miracles, and they wanted to know more. Today, we would refer to these people as groupies, okay? These were people that were just kind of dabbling at following this revolutionary rabbi of the time. 
but they weren't yet committed to him. And Jesus wants to make it clear that the dabbling is just not enough. What he's really after is commitment. That's a necessity. Do you realize, he was saying, what following me and taking my ministry and my mission upon yourselves might just cost you? Do you know what that is? Well, the very first Jewish Christian readers of Luke's Gospel were also beginning to see what following Jesus would involve. And it wasn't a very pretty picture. There was an increasingly intense pressure on them to either renounce Jesus as the risen Messiah or get disinherited from their own families and even get thrown out of the temple completely. What a choice, huh? Now, let's be honest, in about 99.9% .9 of our situations, we are not going to be disinherited by our nuclear families for claiming to be Christians. A believer, a follower of Jesus, it just won't happen here, not in this country. But the thing is, there are other groups and other families that we can and do belong to that will indeed demand that we make a choice. And that choice is between them, for example, and exercising our faith when it comes to worship. Best example I can think of is something that we've all had to live with for decades now. Okay, the coach or the team that decides to hold a practice or a meeting on Sunday morning and forces you to make a choice. You're either here on Sunday for the sake of the team or you're off the team. Your decision. But the message is not so subtle. Instead, it's very clear. This message is exactly the same as those first Christians faced. Renounce your worship or we're going to disinherit you. There's this old Jewish saying, it's really a proverb, it goes like this, where there is too much, something is missing. Where there is too much, something is missing. Seems to me that Jesus is saying that very thing to us today. In the midst of our myriad of commitments in daily life, something is still missing. The trouble with one's family and friends and all that one has is that there's something essential that we still do not have enough of. And Jesus uses two illustrations here to make that point. He says it's like setting out to build a tower or any other kind of construction, or to go out and wage a war, only to discover halfway through the project that you've run out of bricks or troops. Something is lacking. So to draw the parable, it's, it's not that my marital or my family or my occupational or school responsibilities are simply too much for me. That's not the case. On the contrary, it's what my responsibilities do not have, what they cannot give, that needs to be exposed here. They cannot, even though I may want them to, even though I always imagine that they can, they cannot make life ultimately worthwhile. And the illusion that they can, that they can make me into somebody, that is what needs to be hated. And by hating, Jesus was not referring to an emotion here. We know that's not healthy. Hating here simply means renouncing. In other words, distancing ourselves from whatever it might be that would water down or eliminate our loyalty to Jesus. So it's not my job, it's not my team, it's not my marriage that needs renouncing, but rather the assumption that any or all of them are the key to my survival, the key to my identity or the key to my self-worth. Family bonds, whatever form that might take, is the first cost of discipleship. So let's put that coin now in the in the baptismal font. That cost is really quite high when we stop and think about it. But Jesus is done, there's more. The second cost of a discipleship is protection. Here Jesus says that we need to turn loose of personal safety, that we need to live behind, leave behind the lifestyle 
that focuses on self-preservation. Now that's a high cost indeed in this take care of myself world in which we live. The operative principles in our world are, well, they're quite different. It's watch your backside, never trust anyone, charity begins at home. To err is human, to forgive is not our policy. Huh? But in the face of all that, take up your cross and follow me just doesn't fly. And even if it does, the possibility of physically dying for one's faith is remote in our neck of the woods. But dying to self means something perhaps a little different than what we thought. I think it mainly refers to the radical change in life that we have to anticipate and accept if we're going to choose to be a disciple of Jesus, if we're actually going to follow him out into life. That mad scramble to preserve my life as it is must end. And it must also be brought under the Lordship of Jesus. And that means that I must be willing to accept the changes that Jesus will bring about in me as I begin following him through life. Maybe that sounds easy, I don't know. But look at the radical changes that God brought about in the lives of some of our biggest Bible heroes. Moses, for example, <laughs> he was changed from a shepherd to a leader of his people. Amos, he was a simple herdsman, was turned into a prophet. Paul was changed from a well-known Christian killer into one of the most renowned apostles there ever was. And let's, of course, not forget Martin Luther, a man whose life was changed from that of a lawyer to a priest and finally to a reformer of the entire church. Whoever does not hate even life itself, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me, cannot be my disciple. Perhaps a higher cost than even the first. And finally, the third cost, that of renouncing personal possessions. So therefore, Jesus says, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all of your possessions. Well, what in the world is that all about? That's a general statement. And it flies contrary to everything we've, we've learned about stewardship in scriptures. According to the Bible, all the possessions that we have are gracious gifts from a very loving God. And those are meant not to be squandered, not to be thrown away. They're meant to be used, to be enjoyed, to share. So what in the world is Jesus getting at here? Well, we do know some examples where Jesus was very serious and meant it literally. Leaving it all behind as you follow Jesus around the foot, uh, foothills of Palestine might have been a necessity for those first disciples. What else could they do? And perhaps for some people today, it could mean the equivalent of sell all you have, give to the poor, and then come follow me. But for most of us, I think it means something a bit different. I think what it really means is, well, captured in this little phrase, give up and open up. Okay? Give up seeing possessions as your means to security. And then open up your vision so that you begin to see those possessions as gifts to be used in all aspects of your life. For the well-being of yourself and others, but all to the glory of God. Now that's a far different answer to the question, for whom are we here? So family, personal safety, and now financial security, they're all part of that cost. The high price. <laughs> the high price that Jesus demands from each and every one of us if we're going to call, us, call ourselves his disciples. Well, all three of the coins are now in the baptismal font, that fountain of life. All have been offered. And now there's nothing left. And that, you see, is precisely the point. That there is nothing left, nothing left to get in the way of our answering the call to discipleship. 
Yet what we discover in the absence of coins is that we gain far more than we ever give up. Along the way, we manage to share the joy and companionship of other disciples, all of you sitting here this morning. And when we face our cross, we know we don't ever face it alone, relying on our own meager resources. Other followers on the way are there to support us, helping us when we are weak, just like we help them when they are weak. And as we gather together, we find ourselves strengthened through not just the word, but also through the offering of Jesus himself in the sacrament. And more importantly, know this, that even though our crosses will be heavy, and make no mistake, they are, Christ has taken the actual killing weight of each and every one of our crosses on himself. So with his help, we can pick up our crosses. We can take to the road. Our hearts are lightened in the promise that the journey will never be boring and that the homecoming will be worth every effort and more. Amen.